We are honored tonight to have uh, Rabbi Murray Ezring with us. He is uh, he was born in Rock Island, Illinois. He received his bachelor's in history, and he has been a rabbi for is it forty three years? Did I get that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, most recently, he is in Norfolk. He is the uh, interim rabbi. He has served as a chaplain for the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department. He served as, uh, he's, he's, first of all, he's nationally recognized for his community building initiative. He is a board member of Mecklenburg Industries. He was awarded the Unitarian Award of the Year, 1999, by the Charlotte Post. Uh, he's known throughout the world for his use of movies to make his point. Uh, he has spoken to, he was, we were honored to have him speak at our convention in 2001 on building the faith, keeping the faith. Uh, he is married to his wife, Barbara, and the par proud parents of four children, Aviva, Tammy, Ron, and Gil. Rabbi, please. Thank you very much, Alan. Uh, I want to start just by reminding people that storytelling is not necessarily for entertainment, but the real reason rabbis have told stories throughout our history is because we use stories to teach. And people find learning from a story is oftentimes much easier and more rewarding than learning from a lecture. The great mystic Nachman of Bratislav once declared, some people tell stories to get others to fall asleep. I tell stories in order to work, wake them up. This evening, I'm going to tell a couple of stories. I want to start with one about one of the most famous rabbis in the Mishnah, Shimon Bar Yochai. He was one of two very famous students of Rabbi Akiva's and one of only two who was ordained by Rabbi Akiva, he and Rabbi Meir. Shimon Bar Yochai has a very colorful history. He's known as a great mystic. And we also know from some of the stories that he was a man who could have a temper. One day, according to Shabbat Da'ath 33 in the Babylonian Talmud, Shimon was engaged in casual conversation with two of his colleagues and friends. Rabbi Yehuda commented, how pleasant are the actions of Rome? They build marketplaces, bridges, and bathhouses. Rabbi Yossi was uncustomarily silent at that comment. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says, everything that they have built, they build for their own needs and desires. They raise marketplaces for their prostitutes, bathhouses to pamper themselves and bridges to collect taxes from all who pass over them. In contrast to Rabbi Yehuda's praising Roman culture, Shimon Bar Yochai only saw the sensuality, lust, and greed of Roman silver, civil engineering. Rabbi Shimon's critique of the Romans found a way to Roman ears. And in absentia, he was tried and condemned to death by a Roman court. And so he, along with his son, went to hide. They escaped first to the Beit Midrash. And when they were afraid that the Romans were getting closer and closer to searching the Beit, they escaped to a hidden cave. And for 12 years, they hid in that cave. For 12 years, the only drink they had was from a small spring just outside the cave. The only food they were able to enjoy was the carrot tree. 12 years alone studying Torah had a major effect on Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's view of the world, view of Jews, view of the way we do behave and the way we should behave. And eventually at the end of 12 years, it was time to come out of hiding. It was difficult to come out. For in many ways, hiding in a cave for 12 years is like a 12 year long Shabbat where you get to study Torah. You don't have to worry about everything. You don't have to worry about making a living. 
You don't have to worry about politics. And at the end of the 12 years, he and his son come out of the cave. They were ready to join the real world again, they thought. What reality would they find? Would they be able to reintegrate their spiritual and physical needs and beings? And it turns out that the return to the real world was far more difficult than either father or son had ever imagined. As they exited from their hiding place, their first glimpse of real life 12 years after they went into hiding were poor Jews plowing and sowing their fields. They saw the peasants hard at work and Rabbi Shimon remarked to his son, these people abandon Chaye Olam, eternal life, and only worry about Chaye Sha'ah, earthly life. And every place that they looked that enraged them suddenly burst into flame and was destroyed. Suddenly they hear a bat kol from heaven. God's divine voice called out to them. Did you emerge from your cave only to destroy my world? Go back to your cave. The isolation had only increased Reb Shimon's despise for human travail and what they thought was important. Even the simple farmer was seen as too materialistic. When they exit the cave a second time, the sun is setting. It is Erev Shabbat. Rushing by the entrance to their cave is a simple Jewish man carrying two bundles of myrtle branches. Shimon Bar Yochai asks, why are you rushing with these two bundles of myrtle branches? And the man answered, I'm carrying them to sweeten the aroma of my house in honor of Shabbat, which is about to begin. Shimon turned to his son and said, See how lovely and beloved are the mitzvot to the people of Israel and their fears of returning to the world eased. They returned to the people and the land. Now, I will tell you, I used this story first this year at the beginning of May. And what I wanted to ask you was, why do you think I used this story? I think it's rather clear from the story itself, but what do you think I, the point was I was trying to make? Well, if you enough people, we can unmute everyone for the discussion. If, uh, Any ideas? If the rabbi and his son can be in a cave for 12 years, we could be in our houses for three months. <laughs> well, that was part of the parallel I was showing. Anyone have any other idea? It'll be difficult to get back out into the world again. Because it will be difficult to get back into the world again, no matter how much we want to get back into the world. Do you remember the Michigan State House demonstration where militiamen walked into the State House carrying handguns and semi automatic rifles and they drove through the city with? stickers on the back of their trucks and cars, some of which read, on one side had a picture of the American flag and said, this isn't the symbol we need anymore. The other side was a Nazi red flag with a white, a black swastika in the middle of a white circle. There were many people who were violently opposed to coming out or to staying in rather. They wanted to come out no matter what the result would be. And it was all over the country. And I used Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the great mystic of the Talmud, to show that anybody who is forced by whatever reason to remain isolated for a long period of time has trouble reintegrating into society. And sometimes, we can get violent about it. And that's what we saw here. And in fact, until race became the major issue in the streets of America, the major violence dealt with people wanting to get out 
of their homes and go back to doing whatever they wanted in any way they want. And, and I would ask you, do they, do we today, when we go outside of our homes, do we wear masks at least to protect others from germs we may be carrying? Do we socially distance? Are we complaining to our synagogues that it's time for us to reopen completely? Are we threatening to leave synagogues that don't respond to our requests? Or are we willing to give the community a chance to deal with a new reality? A new reality, which I fear we are going to be dealing with for at least another year to two. Um, and what the new reality will be after the time period is over, I don't think we yet have a vision. So that was my first story. My second story for tonight, and it will probably turn into two, is a wonderful story which I found first years ago in a book called Small Miracles of Love and Friendship written by Yitta Halberstam and Judith Leventhal. It's the story of Nana Rizzo, not a well-known woman except to her family. And she had a, her youngest granddaughter, whose name was Andrea, two years old, was the love and light of her life at the moment. <clears throat> and when the two of them were together, they could spend hours sitting on the floor, hours playing make-believe games with Andrea, the two-year-old, giggling and laughing and enjoying herself so much, no one could believe it because no one else in the family, including her mother and father, was able to keep the little girl's attention. Then one day, it was Father's Day, just as we're about to celebrate this Sunday. And Nana Rizzo decided she was going to go over to her son's house, who was Andrea's father, and spend the day with them. And she went, and of course, Andrea jumps into her lap and where she's sitting out by the pool, and the two of them are playing for several hours. And then the rest of the children all arrive, all the cousins, and great cousins, and second cousins, and third cousins, and they all go in to play in the pool. But Andrea stays with Nana Rizzo. When the children are tired of being playing around in the pool, they go inside, they dry off, they change their clothes, and they play games inside the house. The parents and the adults are all sitting around in a circle, drinking and conversing, and happy as can be, knowing that their family is so close. And all of a sudden, Nana Rizzo cries out, Andrea is in the pool. Her mother, Barbara, was out of her seat like a flash and into the water, brought her daughter up out of the water. She had turned blue, she wasn't breathing. She started to perform CPR. And everyone had gathered around to see what they could do to help. Except Nana Rizzo. Nana Rizzo stayed in her seat by the pool and said, dear God, I am old. I have lived a long and happy, wonderful life. Take me and let Andrea live. And then, a man who was visiting their next door neighbor and had no idea what this family was like, heard the commotion and wasn't sure whether it was a wild party of young people or if something was really problematic that was happening. And so he decided last minute to break through the bush barrier and see if he could be of help. He saw what was going on, walked over to Barbara, the mother who was performing CPR and said to her, have you tried the Heimlich maneuver yet? And she said, no. So he went between the mother and daughter, lifted the daughter into a sitting position, 
put his hands in a fist right under her rib cage and gently pushed three times. And suddenly water came gushing out of her mouth. The mother went back to giving CPR and Andrea was fine. The rest of the day, everyone enjoyed. And from that day on, everyone was as happy as could be having been able to survive the problem they had. But something strange was happening with Nana Rizzo. Nana Rizzo was getting sick. She'd never really been sick in her life, but she was in pain, she was running a fever. She was taken to a doctor the next week and diagnosed with advanced cancer throughout her organs. The doctor said it was going to be a very painful but a very swift end. And as everyone else got better and Andrew would come to visit, Nana Rizzo never complained about the pain the doctor said she would have. And then two months to the day after her granddaughter had drowned, Nana Rizzo died. That night, Andrea woke up in the middle of the night screaming. Her mother ran into her room, picked her up, cuddled her, said, Andrea, Andrea, it's okay. You're, just, you're in bed, you had a nightmare. And she said, Mommy, I, I, I just saw myself at the bottom of the pool. I couldn't see anything else. I was there. And she said, but it's okay because I jumped in and I pulled you out. And she said, Mom, in my dream, it wasn't you that pulled me out. It was Nana Rizzo. And I can't forget her. And I can't thank her for what she did to save my life. That, to me, is a very powerful story. And when I told it earlier in the summer, the people who were listening were in tears. I thought it would be a positive, uplifting story because for me, it proved something to me. It proved to me that when we die, there is still life for us. And sometimes we can reach through the barrier of God's domain to our domain to let our relatives know that we're still watching them and we want to help them in some manner. That's, I've used that story many times because in my life, the single most frequently asked question as a rabbi I receive can you prove to me there's life after death? And that was always the best story I had until 1992. In 1992, 93, I was one of three rabbis who was leading a group of 500 people from the Federation in Boca Raton, Florida to Israel. One day towards the end of the trip, we climbed, we were going to Masada and we were told it's five o'clock in the morning and it's already a hundred degrees. We don't want anyone climbing Masada. But two young women in their late thirties decided they've been training to run up Masada for a year. And so they started running up and I noticed they both forgot water. So I travel in a hunting vest with lots of big pockets and I filled them all with bottles of water and I started up after them. What a schnook I am. I walked up 10 minutes, and all of a sudden, I felt like I had been hit by a sledgehammer in my gut. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. I almost fell over. I caught myself on a rock and sat myself down. I was perspiring unbelievably. And sure enough, one of my friends from Boca Raton, my orthopedic surgeon to be precise, who was on the trip had followed me up. And, he, and I tried to get up to go continue walking with him. He said, Murray, sit down, sit down. He took my pulse. He says, your pulse is beating so quickly, I can't feel anything. 
said, you are perspiring at such a rate, you're going to dehydrate quickly. And so he took out two bottles of water from my pockets, poured them over my head, made me breathe slowly and deeply, and we started down the mountain. What took us 10 minutes, what took me 10 minutes to climb, took us an hour and a half to go down. Every step was excruciating to me. It felt like I was exploding inside. They got me to the first aid hut, hooked me up to an EKG machine that went to Tel Ashomer Hospital in um, Tel Aviv. And they said, nothing shows here. Just let him rest and send him back to his hotel. But I didn't rest. I fainted. I was out. They couldn't rouse me. So my doctor convinced the guy to take out the ambulance and drive me 90 minutes to Soroka Medical Center in Beersheba. Halfway through the trip, I woke up. And I sat up and I looked at him. I said, oh, Peter, I didn't realize you were in the car with me. He said, that's all right, Murray, just lay down and go to sleep. And I said, I know you're worried. And I remember you're saying that you thought I was having a heart attack. But I want you to know, my Zeta just came to me and told me I'm not having a heart attack. And then I passed out again. And I didn't wake up until we were in the emergency room at Sirocco Medical Center. Uh, and we had to wait for a physician because there had been a terrorist attack and the emergency rooms were very, very busy. When I eventually got to go home, which was, I think, two to two and a half weeks after the trip returned, I had to stay with my brother's in-law and sister-in-law, Barbara's sister, in, outside of Binyamina. I got home, saw Barbara, she saw I was okay. I called my dad. I said, Dad, there was a young man who came to me while I was in the ambulance. And he said he was Zeta, but he didn't look like Zeta. So most of our family pictures had been destroyed in a flood in Rock Island. But they had a few pictures left, and they let me go over and go through the pictures. And all of a sudden, I come across a young picture of a young man, no beard, and I had never seen my grandfather without a beard, no payas. But he did have a, a big high kippah on his head. I said, Dad, who is this guy? And he said, who do you think it is? I said, this is the guy who came to me in the ambulance and said it was Zeta. He said, that was my father when he left the family in Europe to come here and earn money to bring us all to the States. So today I combine those two stories, usually to prove to people that I have reason for believing that life continues. And when I tell these stories, I very often get emails or letters from people who hear them telling me of their personal stories. And after years, they thought that they were going out of their mind for thinking that their dreams or their visions could possibly have been true. So stories are very important additives to our lives. And I know that um, I had promised I wouldn't tell more than two or three stories, but I believe I have a little time yet left. And if everyone's not asleep yet, uh, there's one more I'd like to share with you. It's a story that I told this morning. In many, it's a Holocaust story, and I'm going to read it to you, if you're up for it. Okay. In the early 60s, in an old ramshackle church located in a small town in upstate New York, a young idealistic priest, Episcopal priest, valiantly struggled against his church's discouraging state of disrepair and general appearance of genteel poverty. 
One morning when the priest and his wife walked into the building to inspect it after a wild rainstorm and raked the town the previous night, they were concerned that the high gusts may have wreaked serious damage. Their anxiety was well-founded. On the floor, they discovered an enormous chunk of plaster that had fallen from a wall. Its collapse had left a large, gaping, and very ugly hole in the wall. Oh no, moaned the priest's wife, staring with dismay at the destruction. The rampaging winds have created a massive and hideous crater. The young priest felt discouraged. How could this catastrophe have occurred on this particular morning, a morning when it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to find workmen who will quickly repair the damage? He asked his wife, whom she thinks they should call, and she gently reminded him that even if they could find someone to do the job, the church coffer is empty. How will they pay? The priest sighed, shrugged his shoulders, We'll have to come up with a different plan, he says. Later that day, he attended a local charity auction where he had promised to make an appearance a week before. His mind was on the gaping hole in the wall, but he knew that the townspeople were expecting him, and so he went. At the event, a beautiful handmade gold and ivory lace tablecloth was held up by the auctioneer. It was exquisite and eye-catching but no one wanted it because it was oversized. It was huge. What size table did that cloth cover anyway? Someone grumbled in disappointment. Meanwhile, a creative plan is taking root in the priest's mind. No one else wanted the cloth. Why not me? So he measured the elaborate cloth with his eye and determined that it was precisely the right size he needed. It would cover the hideous hole perfectly, and he bought it for only six dollars and elatedly returned to the church with his prize. As he was turning to enter the building, he paused for a moment because he observed an elderly woman shivering in the cold and the wind and the rain standing at the corner bus stop. She was a stranger in town. He looked, she looked as though she had fallen on hard times and her coat seemed too thin to protect her from the harsh winds. So he approached her and asked if she would like to rest in the church for a while and warm up a little bit. And he knew this particular bus route by heart and that the next bus was not due for at least another half hour. The woman eagerly accepts the priest's offer and follows him into the church. And as he begins to hang the tablecloth over the gaping hole, she slips into a pew and rests. And then, her eyes start to rove over the humble church and they widen as she observed the priest busy at his task. She seems transfixed by the scene and she slowly rose and walked over to the wall where the priest was engrossed in his work, her eyes filled with tears. Years ago, she said softly, I owned a very similar tablecloth. My beloved husband, gave it to me with my initials embroidered in one corner. He and the tablecloth belonged to a different time though. They're both gone now. and My life is so empty without him. The priest murmurs his compassion stricken by the woman's sorrowful face. She advances closer. It reminds me so much of my old tablecloth. It's remarkably similar. She walked over as if in a trance. She examined the cloth mutely she motions the priest over to her side. And there are indeed her initials embroidered in the corner of the tablecloth. She tells the priest that she was once an affluent woman in Vienna, Austria, before World War II. During the course of the war, though, she lost her entire family and all her possessions. I don't know how my tablecloth made its way here. The two speculate but cannot come up with a good, acceptable answer. The priest asked the woman, a stranger, how she has come to be in this little town. And she told him that she is from a neighboring city and traveled to this small hamlet to interview for a job as a nanny, but she didn't get the job. The reason she didn't get the job, she thought she was too old. She was disheartened. 
The priest asked her gently, I know I don't have any money I can give you, but if you would like that tablecloth to take home with you, it's yours, it belongs to you, and you should take it. And she said, no, my dining room table now is very small. I am happy that my tablecloth can provide an important function here. Its beauty will enhance your evening service. Later that evening, Services were held in the church, and the church was overflowing with parishioners. Many commented on the magnificent lace tablecloth hanging on the wall, enchanted by its beauty. Several stopped to examine it curiously before hurrying home. One man seems particularly fascinated, almost hypnotized by the resplendent cloth. He's a regular devoted member of the parish for close to two decades now, and he knows the young priest well. He tapped him on the shoulder and the priest, surprised, looked into the man's tear-filled eyes. I have never seen a tablecloth like that since, and he murmured something. Excuse me, the priest asked, bewildered. Years ago, before my life here, I led another life, a totally different one. I lived in Vienna before Hitler assumed power. And in the chaos of the war, my entire family vanished. I searched for them for years afterward but was finally told that they were all dead. I couldn't stay in Vienna alone. There were just too many painful memories and ghosts there. So I made my way to America and settled here. I've made a new life for myself, but I never remarried because no one could replace my dear wife. I once gave her a very similar tablecloth, remarkably similar. In fact, I had her initials embroidered in the corner. Silently, the priest leads the man toward the cloth. He inspects the corner. His eyes light up in wonderment and awe. It's the very same tablecloth. It's her initials, my beloved wife's. How could this possibly be? The priest draped his arm around the elderly parishioner's shoulder and gently guided him to a pew. In a slow and careful way, the priest told him about the woman who had been in the church earlier that day. He chides himself for having failed to take her address in the neighboring city, but is grateful that he remembers the name of the family for whom she had come to interview. In great excitement, the two men track down the family who by great good fortune have saved her application. And the next day, the man joins his wife from whom he has been separated since World War II, reunited by a tablecloth made of lace and gold that had once adorned their lives and has now, in fact, reconnected them. The editor of the book made this comment on the story, that which love embroiders, neither time nor turmoil can erase. Rabbi, would you be willing to go back to your second stories for a moment? Sure. I've never had the experience or know of people who've had the experience that you talked about, of, of, about someone spiritually coming to them. Yes. It's, I've got to co co collect myself. Sorry. So next week is the, is the first anniversary of my wife's passing. But I do believe that she is looking out for her grandchildren and her family, not in the sense of the story that you told about coming but having the belief that how she lived has lived on after her. And that's my reaction to your story. And, you know, no one can, we've never had anyone able to breach 
the barrier from here to God's domain. But there are many stories of people who've gone the other way at times that were necessary to save the lives of their loved ones. But there are other stories of similar things. There's, there was a young man named Johnny in World War I who woke up in the middle of the night because he heard his wife, his mother, calling for him. So he got out and looked around the camp to see who was trying to play this trick on him since there was no one in the camp who knew his mother. But the voice was identical to his memory. And he traveled all around the camp, never found the jokester. But during his journey through the camp, there was a Japanese mortar attack. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a German mortar attack, World War I. And when he returned to his tent, there was nothing left and no one else was alive. When he came home at the end of the war, he was talking to his father and told him about this experience. He said, wait a second, what was the date? He said, why? I said, I took some notes on something your mother said to me. She woke up in the middle of the night screaming your name and warning you that there was about to be a mortar attack on your tent and you had to leave. And the date was the same date. There are many coincidences in life. I believe that you are correct, that the way we usually can tell that someone is living on through us is through our actions and how well we reflect their deeds and their teachings. Um, to this day, I try to live up to what my mother and father taught me when they were alive. And every time that I feel I have failed to do so, I feel about that big and I work on getting better. I never really knew my grandfather, which makes this all the more surprising event to me. He died when I was seven years old and I think we had gone to New York to see him three or four times in my lifetime from Rock Island. And he said he was my Zeta. I believed him, even though I didn't recognize him. Once I saw that picture, it was enough for me. Everyone looks for, have you ever thought you saw your wife in, behind you in a mirror or across the street that she walked on frequently? No. Many people do. And I tell them, don't be afraid when you, if, you, if that happens to you, because these are memories that are stored in our mind. And if we're bothered, if, we're, if we have something difficult we're dealing with and we need their advice, our memories draw them fo forward within our minds. Um, but I, I pray that someday you will feel comfortable if you're not already with the answer you've come up with. It's the answer that most people have. Um, but there are strange things that happen. Um, Thank you, Rabbi. No, I, I'm sorry I can't give you a better answer than that. But I think it, it was good for you to voice that. Anyone else like to say anything? I'm, and now I'm taking too much time. <laughs> Well, I want to say how wonderful those stories were, Rabbi. They were very touching, and I'm going to remember those. Uh, they really, they, you've, already, you've already made, an, you made a, an impact on my life 19 years ago. Now you've made another one in 2000. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for presenting. It was a wonderful session. Uh, we yeah. really appreciate your time, and uh, I know that everybody here got a lot out of, uh, out of your remarks. Just wonderful. And Alan, thank you for putting this together. Rabbi, thank you. For this was wonderful. Us. Thank it's you. It's always a pleasure to work with the FJMC, as it has been for me to work with the W, with the Women's League of Conservative Judaism, WLCJ. Uh, my wife is on the call, <laughs> so I want to give her a shout out too. Um, and I, I will share with you one of the most beautiful experiences, dominant, that I've had in the last 
20 years or more was at the joint Shabbat Shabbaton that the men's club and women's league shared at the convention in Alexandria. Those services were so moving and you know, Chuck got everyone up and dancing, including me. Um, and it was just great evening. So thank you to all of you for everything you do. And you have, what a list of webinars you've had. And it's just amazing because this is the way we reach out and keep connected. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank, thank you, you so much, Robin. Thank you. thank you so much. Have a good night and stay well. Good night. Bye-bye.